Hello everyone. This is a series of keynotes on online and blended learning. I'd like to thank the Commonwealth of Learning for their support um, in, in making these videos. This presentation is about new learning technologies and their potential and limitations for teaching and learning. In this overview, we're talking about the hype and the reality about new technology. What the key trends are with, with technologies in teaching and learning. I want to talk about the difference between synchronous and asynchronous learning and technologies. I'm going to talk about some simple technology, uh, modern technology, new technologies that's very simple to use. Um, I'm going to talk about emerging technologies that are not so much in use at the moment, but some of which I think will be. I'm going to talk about the relationship between technology and assessment of students. Then I'm going to talk about the issue of how we choose which technologies to use and end up with some conclusions. New technologies are constantly emerging and the Gartner Consulting Company has come up with a very useful graph that gives a general overview of what happens when new technology comes in. Uh, you'll see from the graph that uh, when a new technology comes in it gets a lot of hype, it gets a lot of publicity, um, and it reaches what's called a peak of inflated expectations. People make claims for it that in reality just don't turn out. And as people start to use the technology and find out what its limitations are, uh, the expectations gets, uh, goes right down and you get a trough of disillusionment. And then what generally happens then is that people find the niche of that technology, what it does really well, um, so then you get up, go up the slope of enlightenment and eventually it finds its place with all the other technologies and the things that we do and reaches what's called a plateau of productivity. And we've, we've got some very good instances of that in online learning. I think uh, massive open online courses are a very good example of that. But this is from the business community and education is different from business. So we need, even though uh, a technology might have reached a plateau of productivity in the business sector, it's still got to be tested out in education to see if it meets the requirements of education. And what this means, of course, is that for most instru instructors, they tend to be what's called late adopters rather than early adopters of new technology. But at the same time, it's important that instructors should explore uh, new technologies, preferably when a lot of the kinks have been worked out. A um, good example of that is Zoom and the concerns about security. It took a while for Zoom to get that, uh, to nail that down, but now it's a pretty secure platform. Um, but uh, it was important that instructors uh, experimented with Zoom very early on because without that, it would have been very difficult to have moved online during COVID-19. Now, are we in a world of Zoom? Uh, I'll give you some data here from Canada. Uh, in 2019, the Canadian Digital Learning Research Association did a survey of all Canadian universities and colleges. And they found that 93% of them were using a learning management system or a virtual learning environment. And only 63% were using video conferencing. This is for online courses. Um, in the middle of uh, COVID-19, around about July, uh, Quality Matters, an American organization, did a study and they found that 97% of institutions were using a learning management system and 88% were using conferencing. So there was obviously a small increase in learning management systems because it was almost at full capacity already, but video conferencing jumped up by 25% as a result of COVID-19. Um, and I have to be careful here because they're different surveys with different sample bases, but I, I think that pretty well reflects the actual situation. So we've seen a big jump in the use of uh, video conferencing technologies such as Zoom for online learning as a result of COVID-19. And this brings us to a distinction between synchronous and asynchronous learning. Why was Zoom so popular with instructors during COVID-19? 
Well, first of all, it's easy for most instructors to use. It, it's, uh, it can be used on virtually any platform, uh, Android or Mac. Uh, it can be used on iPads, iPhones, uh, tablets, uh, or, or for computers. And when it's broadcast live, and uh, students are watching at the same time as the instructor, it's a synchronous technology. However, it can also, like many synchronous technologies, also be recorded, and at which point it becomes asynchronous, because once it's recorded, anyone can download it at any time, if it's publicly available. And there's little change for instructors, uh, or there was little change for instructors when they moved to it. They, they, they were used to doing lectures, so they carried on doing lectures. They didn't have to change their teaching approach or their teaching methodology. Um, so it's easy to move immediately and within a two-week period from fully face-to-face -to, -face to fully online. But it's mainly good for content delivery. Um, that's how it's being used anyway. Um, it's, it's being used for lectures primarily. Now a learning management system like Moodle or Blackboard or Canvas uh, called virtual learning environments in other countries, uh, in some countries, uh, these are asynchronous. Uh, now, until Zoom came along, this would be the core of most online courses. This is where it's, students would go to every day for their studies. Um, and that meant, of course, that because it's asynchronous, it's very convenient. Students can access it whenever they want and at any, any place they want, um, if they've got their mobile phone or some other tablet or a computer with them. And to be honest, in the past, it's been used for more active learning than Zoom. Uh, there's a lot of passive listening to Zoom, whereas with, um, on, with asynchronous learning management systems, there are activities built in. You have to do stuff all the time if you're in the learning management system, even if it's just page turning. And it's a bigger change for instructors moving to asynchronous teaching, and I'll talk a bit more about that later. And as a result, it facilitates course redesign and it's designed for individual students working individually in, on their own, although you can build in uh, discussion forums and social communication, but it's primarily a tool for an individual student to work on their own. So they have much more control over the learning environment than they do in a Zoom conference. Now, both synchronous and asynchronous tools have value, but I'm going to argue that for online learning, uh, the, the asynchronous nature of the tools that are asynchronous have a big advantage over tools that are synchronous. The other te technologies I want to talk about are simple, easy to use, free technologies. Uh, free in the sense that people are already like to have this te technology, often in their pockets. And mobile phones are the best example of this, although iPads and so on can be a little bit better for slightly higher quality and so on. So mobile phones allow simple videos to be made by instructors. The one on the right here is a video of a plastinated model of a dog's heart, which is uh, which the, the instructor, she just took the model, um, took it apart, videoed it uh, on her mobile phone, and then she's used a QR code there so students can photo the QR code and upload the video um, from the university server. So that's a very simple use of, of video. She did that on her own without any technical support. It took her about an, an hour, she said, to really man manage the handling of it so that she could actually get clear pictures and so on. And she did a little bit of editing, um, but generally she did it in more or less one shot. So that's what I mean by a simple video. And then there are existing apps like Google Earth that can be used in a number of subject areas where you can actually go in and see things and uh, use, uh, see them in real time as well. Then you can use uh, mobile phones for interviews, for instance. You can do audio or video interviews. Um, so you could go out and interview experts in the field, for instance. Uh, one common use is when a visiting professor comes through and you 
uh, want to capture their expertise and build it into your course. You just take an uh, on audio interview. Then there are student projects. Students can use these simple media. In fact, they probably use them better than you can. And so in some courses, for instance, students might make a, their own YouTube video of an elevator pitch for a, a businessman where they can encapsulate the, the product idea in a two minute video. And it, also students are using video in their teaching practice to record what they've done and then go back and analyze it afterwards. So mobile phones have a, a lot of potential use and I'm going to argue it's very much underused the potential of these simple tools. And then there are blogs and wikis that uh, both can be, you can have both a course wiki or a course blog or a student blog or a wiki. If you're not sure what a wiki is, it's, it's a collaborative tool. It, it's like, like having an individual blog that you can post, but um, it, it, it's a group one. So several people can contribute to it and edit it. And at the University of British Columbia, John Beasley Murray, for instance, uh, used uh, blogs and wikis on his Latin American course. See, uh, the students could post their own blogs, but they also did a public wiki in order to get uh, input from people outside the course and particularly from people in Latin America. And because it's public and out on the web, and if you put, use the right kind of terms when people are searching for stuff, they'll come across this by accident and can actually contribute to it. And then there's the use of e-portfolios, and I'll say a bit more about those later. That the, these are uh, digital collections of student work uh, that they can edit and put together, uh, and can, that can be used either for their, uh, their own study purposes or even for assessment purposes. So that's um, the use of simple existing technologies that could be used in teaching and learning. But I think we need to assess new and emerging technologies. Um, and I'm going to give four examples here of, of new technologies that are not widespread, in widespread use in education yet, but have what I consider to be uh, massive potential for education. So I'm going to look at video and simulations, uh, then serious games, virtual and augmented reality, and learning analytics and artificial intelligence. And what I'm going to do is to define each one, give some examples, talk about the affordances, which are really the strengths and weaknesses of each of these tools for teaching and learning. The first example I'm going to show is a simulation. Um, this is demonstrating how a normal curve of distribution is formed. It, it's, it, once you have that piece of equipment, it's not a difficult thing to do, um, but, and it's a very nice ex uh, concrete example of what for many students is a fairly abstract principle, is how a normal curve of distribution is formed. So what are the educational affordances of vid video simulations such as that? Well, they provide concrete examples of abstract ideas. Um, the video demonstrates the concrete aspect and the voice or the audio explains. In, in some ways, the academic analysis is the audio part, although a, a good video will probably capture the abstract ideas as well, the, the video part as well. But often, what, what the uh, voice is doing is interpreting what's happening and explaining what's happening. And this combination of visual and audio the research has showed leads to deeper understanding of such concepts. Uh, once you've got that concept of a normal curve of distribution, then as the mathematics gets added to it about standard deviations and so on, it's much easier for students to understand that. Um, so video simulations are useful for showing processes and for showing procedures and so on, um, or to show how things actually happen in real time. If these are created as open educational resources, then they can be widely available for anyone to use in their teaching. Uh, look out for a Creative Commons license on this materials, which means it's, it's free to use for educational or non-profit purposes. Another emerging technology are serious games. 
Now these have been around for a long time, actually. They've been around for about 15 to 20 years. But <clears throat> recently there's been some development on the educational side. The games have been around, video games, for 20 years. But their applications to education has been limited. Uh, and there's three aspects of them. There's the actual games, the ones that students play uh, to learn. There's game-based learning, that's the pedagogy of games. What people have done is to take the factors that motivate students to play games and apply that to, to learning. And then there's the gamification, which are the principles um, of using games, but maybe used in a, a non-gaming context. Um, an example might be taking a, a regular student activity and giving points and getting students to compete and allowing them to go back and keep doing it until they get to 100%, for instance. Um, so you haven't actually got a game, you've just given kind of rewards, which is using the, some of the principles within gamification. And this is for a course for home social work, for social workers, and it describes a home visit. This is a very tricky thing to teach because Often uh, social workers have to go into difficult situations. And this is an example of a game where the students have to make a choice of what they should do in particular circumstances. What are the correct procedures to follow here? Now Ryerson University has been doing research into serious games and they've identified some core design principles behind serious games. First of all, you have to have a clear learning outcome or outcomes or clear learning goals that you're trying to achieve through the game. Then you have to tell a story. There has to be some kind of story to tell that um, drives the playing of the game. And then there's the actual playing of the game, what the student or learner has to do during the game. And then there's what the user experiences from that. Is it a satisfactory experience? Do they enjoy doing it? Uh, is it motivating for them? And you have to take account of all four of those things when designing an educational or serious game. Now, what are the affordances of serious games? Well, one is motivation and engagement. For instance, you can take a pretty dry academic subject like academic integrity and build a game out of it to make it more interesting so that students actually work all their way through it. Um, problem solving uh, so it helps students to uh, try solving a particular problem and then seeing what the outcome of their attempt at solving that problem was. Communication skills uh, enable them, them to work out the best way to communicate in a difficult situation, for instance. Decision making, what do I do next? Um, and authenticity, it, it adds a, a kind of emotional aspect. They can add an emotional aspect to learning that makes it much deeper. And I think there are many possible educational applications for games. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a technology that I think has not yet uh, reached its, its, its plateau of productivity. Another development is virtual and augmented reality. This is uh, immersive technology where uh, you go into a kind of false world, but it reflects, it's meant to reflect uh, the real world, but in, uh, it replicates it. Um, and it it's combined with your actual actions. You do, learners can actually do things in this virtual world and there are responses from the software to what students do in that real world. So it enables students to identify, manipulate or analyze objects and provides a deeper, richer understanding of what's going on in those contexts. So it allows entry into otherwise dangerous or difficult environments or that will be difficult for them to manipulate in, in, in the real world, for instance. And I'll give some examples. It's been used in interactive molecular dynamics at the University of Bristol. It's been used to teach students how to conduct an orchestra. The orchestra is simulated but as the uh, student uses the baton for both pace and for direction, 
uh, the, 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 or the, the orchestra responds appro uh, accordingly to the, the way the student uses the baton. Um, and it's been used in, for soil science sampling. Um, this is more augmented reality where uh, the student goes into the real world but has a number of tools on their mobile phone that uh, simulates what they're actually going into or provides, for instance, uh, graphics or uh, uh, location sites for the students. So they're combining uh, augmented realities where you combine real reality uh, with technolo te technology tools. So what are the affordances of augmented and virtual reality? In the chemistry case, it gave students deep intuitive understanding of phenomena. These were graduate students who were having problems in chemistry in coming up with intuitive hy hypotheses, uh, sort of a, a guess as to how, what would happen if you interrupted the normal structure of a chemical compound. Um, th they were good at deducting, and they, if, if you did, did something and watch what happens and, and then they could deduce what happens. But knowing what initial um, intervention to make needs some kind of intuitive understanding. And that's what came out of that use of uh, uh, virtual reality for uh, the interactive chemical com compound. The students went in and changed things, and then the whole chain reaction played out, and they were right in the middle of that chain reaction watching what was happening. And it can be a substitute for dangerous or otherwise difficult training environments. Um, the, this is Tina, the avatar. She's a, she's a virtual patient in a hospital. This is from Drexel University. And nurses can interact with her. They can ask her questions. They can uh, reach out to touch her and so on. And she'll react appropriately. Um, she'll cry or she'll jump or she'll flinch. Um, depending on, on what you do. And this enables the nurses to explore and uh, try things out be, on, on a virtual patient without actually hurting or upsetting a real patient and getting the correct procedures and getting the feedback on what they did wrong and so on as a result. It labors you to practice in difficult contexts. Now, virtual and augmented reality is what I call a deep but, but narrow application of technology. Uh, it, it's, not, you, it's not something that's going to be used across the board in all subject areas. There are areas or uh, particular topics or particular learning outcomes that really lend themselves to this, but it doesn't lend itself to a lot of other things. For instance, it's not really good for teaching uh, abstract concepts. Uh, that, that that's probably much better done through text or something like that. But for procedures or uh, in difficult or uh, circumstances, it's, it's a good substitute. And in particular, it, it cuts down the time uh, on maybe expensive or difficult equipment to access, for instance, the training time on that. So it's not actually a replacement for hands-on, but it can actually reduce the hands-on time. Uh, learning analytics and artificial intelligence, these are, uh, learning analytics particularly is growing in education and artificial intelligence is becoming widespread outside of education. And there are three areas in education where it's been, uh, artificial intelligence or learning analytics are being used. One is for institutional purposes. A good example is uh, using artificial intelligence to screen applicants for university um, to help the admissions process. And there, there have been problems with this because of inbuilt bias in the algorithms and so on. But this is one way it has been used. Uh, providing student support, not direct teaching, but providing feedback to students if they ask common questions, for instance, to save the instructor answering those questions. And less it's been used for direct instructional purposes. Now, why, are, um, why is artificial intelligence and learning analytics considered important? 
Well, one main reason, of course, is to lower labour costs. It, it, the, the hope of many people promoting artificial intelligence is that it will cut down the amount of time that expensive instructors and teachers uh, will have to spend with students. So it's an attempt to increase output or effectiveness. And I'm bringing this up because there are a lot of problems in this area. The main area applications, as I said, are learning analytics, that's collecting data about students and using that data to, de to drive decision making. A clear example of the application of that to teaching would be to go back over three years of teaching and look at student uh, grades, for instance, on particular assignment questions and identify which are the ass assignment questions where students are having most difficulty. And that allows the instructor then to identify whether it's the wording of the question that's the problem or whether it's the actual teaching of the topic that's the problem. Uh, then the direct teaching has been so far mainly applied to things like intelligent tutoring systems. Uh, this is where um, students are given uh, stuff to learn and then they're tested on their comprehension and understanding and sometimes uh, on, on procedures and so on. And if they get it wrong, um, they're redirected back to the section of the course that they need um, to, in order to uh, try again until they master it. And uh, another more interesting use is the use of chatbots Chatbots are um, pieces of software that roam an online dis uh, discussion forum or comments or chat chats um, and identifies common questions or comments. It, it does that by identifying the, the words around topics and so on and then provides extra feedback on, on those comments. Or it may just identify the most common questions asked and, for instance, in a MOOC with several thousand students, it identifies which ones are the most common questions and directs those to the instructor who can then address them in the next uh, presentation of the MOOC. Its main use has really been for assessment and evaluation. And it's quite good at doing quantitative assessment for, under, for measuring comprehension and understanding. And it's also used, sometimes the term used is personalization of learning, where it, it doesn't send all students back to do something again, but only those students who are having problems with a particular concept. And I have a lot of problems with this, to be honest. This kind of uh, use of computers is not really artificial intelligence. It's been around for ever since uh, uh, Skinner in the 1960s, who brought in uh, 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 learning machines. Um, and it, it really is just, a, it doesn't deal with the more difficult aspects of learning, uh, where there's interpretation or where there's alternative a range of possible alternative answers that the instructor can't anticipate, which could be quite valid. So, yes, for straight memorization and comprehension, it's fine, but it, it's been limited so far. That's not to say artificial intelligence can't move into the other areas, but it hasn't done so at the moment. Modern artificial intelligence has so far failed to deliver instructionally. Um, it's useful in some support areas, good for content delivery, memorization and testing, but no success yet in higher order skills development. That's not to say that it couldn't be useful there. Basically, there's been little investment in education of the order that will be needed to drive that kind of use of technology for teaching. And I suspect that because it requires very large amounts of data and a kind of random sorting of that data in order to look for patterns and so on, that this is likely to happen outside the formal education system. It's going to be something that if the big high-tech companies really get interested in, they are the ones who are going to develop these uh, uh, higher order levels of artificial intelligence. And if they do that, I think everybody in the public education system needs to look out because governments will see this as a much cheaper but not necessarily more effective way of teaching 
um, at particularly at a post-secondary level. Now, there's need for guidelines um, on the use of all these emerging technologies. What criteria should we use for making decisions? Um, and are we talking about technology or media? The two terms are often used interchangeably, but I make a distinction. I see technology as tools. Um, they, they sit there until somebody does something with them, whereas a medium is a much richer uh, so I think we need to distinguish between media and technology, and I'll say a bit more about that in, in the moment. And then what we need to look for are what are these different media really good for, and how do they differ from other media in doing this? And in particularly in the educational context, what are their educational affordances? But also there are many other factors that you have to take into account, not just the educational affordances, although they're important, but other factors like cost and convenience. So let's look at media first. Um, there are four aspects of a medium. First of all, uh, somebody who creates, creates content for the media. Secondly, the technology through which the medium flows. Thirdly, a receiver at the other end. And fourthly, and most important, some kind of message that goes through that. And I like to talk about media rather than technology because that allows us to look at face-to-face -face teaching as just another medium of teaching with a lot of other media that are around. Face-to-face -face teaching isn't a tool, it's a medium. You can think of the classroom, the physical classroom, and the desks and the chairs and the whiteboard as the technology of face-to-face -face teaching. But a classroom that's empty without instructor and students is not a medium. So let's look at some of the technologies. Well, text has been a really important medium for teaching since the Renaissance. Uh, the big universities were create, created or expanded almost as a result of the printing press and text is really important and I'll come up to some of its uh, affordances in a moment but a typical use of text uh, is books, newspapers, journals etc. Then there are graphics, you see a graphic on the right this is a visual representation of an abstract mathematical formula so they can be uh, images, tables, pictures, cartoons and so on. Then there's audio and that comes in a number of uh, technolo technological forms. Uh, radio programs, cassettes, podcasts these days. Then there's video, movies, uh, YouTube, documentaries, talking heads, demonstrations, all kinds of uses of video besides elect delivering lectures. Then there's computing, uh, adaptive learning, artificial intelligence, animations, simulations, virtual reality. Um, in fact, you could break out some of those into their own media as they become more and more widely used. Then there's social media such as Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And then lastly there's face-to-face -face, uh, uh, teaching such as classroom teaching or tutorials. So what are the pedagogical affordances of the different media? Well I've listed a lot of these in my book and I can only give you a quick run over here but text is very good for uh, abstract ideas. Uh, it, it's reproducible. You can uh, transmit it to many people through publishing the same idea in many copies of a book, for instance. It's uh, observable. You can uh, challenge it. It's, it's, it's there in front of you. Um, and it's been very useful as a, a, a pedagogical tool in, in certainly higher education. Graphics are good for visualization, for giving people another perspective on maybe a, a fairly abstract principles. Audio is very good for language learning, but also it can be very good for informal learning in the sense of giving students feedback. I use podcasts, for instance, to talk very um, casually to students about topics, that, uh, about certain topics, particularly if there's a news item that is relevant to that topic. I can use a podcast, it's very quick and easy to do, and it's more informal than uh, a lecture or a presentation. Video is good for dynamic change, for showing processes and so on, and lots of different affordances for video. 
Computing is good for objective assessment and so on. Social media is very good for student collaboration. Um, again, as well as affordances, there are disadvantages as well. So you have to look at the, 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 the balance of uh, affordances versus disadvantages. And then there's the face-to-face -face teaching. And that depends on the context and how you use face-to-face -face teaching. But um, it can be very good for um, uh, group work, for instance, um, where the instructor is present and students have to think on their feet. And one of the things I think the big challenge is now, as more and more technology gets used in teaching, we really have to focus on the specific affordances of face-to-face. -face. What can it do better than other technologies can do. And I think we haven't really identified that yet. And as I said, this is a work in, pro in, pro in progress. There's not a lot of agreement on these things, and there haven't been a lot of research and testing in the field. But I don't think we're actually going to be able to use technologies very well in education unless we are, have a better understanding of their affordances and their weaknesses in particular contexts. And that means then that we need to have a, a, a way of making judgments about different technologies and their use. And this is my own model, the sections model. Um, and you'll see there are eight components of it. Uh, who are your students? Um, simple thing like, can they access this technology? Do they have access to this technology? It's no good using, no matter how powerful virtual reality is, if students don't have headsets or can't get into the, uh, a, a virtual reality studio, then it's not much use to them. How easy is it to, for both you as an instructor and for the students to use? If you have to have a lot of training on it, you're probably not going to use it. Uh, how much time does it take to create materials in this medium? Uh, how much, what's the cost of doing this? Is it really high cost? Then we come to the affordances of the media. What are the uh, in media characteristics and how well can you embed them in your instructional strategies? Um, what level of interaction does it provide between the student and the technology or the student and the instructor? What are the organizational issues? Uh, do you have to have a studio? Do you have access to the resources that you need, et cetera? Um, will, the, will the institution or the accreditation agencies allow you to use this technology? Then there's networking. How well does it put students in contact with one another? Or does it allow you to go outside uh, uh, and network with the world, for instance? And lastly, and very importantly, how secure is this and how well does it enable you to, and, and students to manage privacy issues in it? And there's another model um, for media selection uh, by Puente, um, Ruben Puentadura called the SAMA model, which I find quite useful. Um, you can use technology as a straight substitution for something else. The best example of that is taking a lecture and putting it on Zoom. You're substituting the face-to-face -face environment with the online environment, but you haven't changed the teaching at all. And then there's augment augmentation, where technology acts as a direct tool substitute with some functional improvement. Sometimes you can use a PowerPoint slide to augment your lecture. You haven't changed the lecture, but you've augmented it with the technology. Then there's modification. You do actually do things somewhat differently in order to incorporate the technology. And then there's redefinition, where you completely change uh, and do something completely different that you wouldn't be able to have done if you, without the technology, which is a transformation then. And I find that can be used in, with the sections model. The section model really is a kind of before thing. Uh, should I use this technology? And I see the summer model as, a, as an after thing. Uh, where I, how far up this scale could I get with my teaching? And I don't believe there's a, a, what I would call a value judgment here. I'm, substitution, as in COVID-19, may be perfectly appropriate. Um, but you may be more ambitious and want to redefine your teaching, and then you would be going up for the top level of this model. And lastly, technology has an impact on new assessment methods. 
Um, there's been a lot of controversy about online proctoring, which many students and instructors have found intrusive, uh, having a camera uh, in your living room recording everything that you do while you're taking an assessment. And I think the problem here is that we're focusing on the wrong issue here. What we're trying to do is to take uh, a 19th century form of assessment, paper and pencil, and move it to a digital environment. Uh, what we need to do is to change the way we assess learning. And the important thing about online learning is it allows student work to be continuously tracked. You can go in and see what students are doing if they're using a learning management system, for instance. You can see what activities they've done. You don't have to be evaluated even. You can have a spreadsheet with students' names along down the left-hand side and the activities across the top and just tick them, tick them off as you see them doing those activities. And if a student hasn't done any activity during a week, it's not an assessment thing. You can just send them an email and say, are you having problems? Uh, uh, I noticed you haven't done it. This is very good to keep them working, incidentally. But you could use it as an assessment tool if you wanted to as well. And I like this because I can see how students are developing during a course and I get a much better understanding of what they've done if they, than if they've just done a written paper at the end. And it doesn't have to be either or. You, you, you can combine formative with, uh, con with a summative assessment at the end. But again, what we could be using are tools like ePortfolios where students uh, are constantly adding to the ePortfolio and changing it and bringing it up to date. So the ePortfolio at the end of the course is far better than what they did at the beginning of the course. And again, you can track that progress and assess students on that. And that to me is a much more authentic way of assessing students than giving them a, a, a yes and no answer test or asking them to do stuff with a, a monitor in real time over a two hour period. So there are a number of teaching issues that come out of these emerging technologies. First of all, I think that multimedia and open education resources are grossly underused in teaching, particularly the higher education in the moment. Uh, content delivery has been used via Zoom rather than skills development. If we're looking at skills development, then I think multimedia have a lot of different uses. Instructors are doing the hard work here. Uh, st instructors are organizing the content, they're interpreting it, they're uh, delivering it to the students. And st students in that kind of teaching are relatively passive. Um, what we need to do is to get the students doing that work and using the technology to enable the students to do that. There are a few examples in emergency remote learning of dynamic video, games and simulations, and open education resources. So the move to um, emergency remote learning has led a number of instructors to experiment and innovate, and I think that's excellent. The problem with a lot of these emerging technologies, there are high development costs, but also high learning returns. So you need a good business plan or a good funding strategy to do this. And I think in the public sector, I think we need some provincial-wide or statewide strategies for open education resources. We need quality education resources. That means good video production as well as good uh, instructional design. Uh, and that costs money. Uh, that means sharing the resources. Why can't we have common open education resources for all first year basic subjects taught through a, through a province or a state? Um, that means also flexible design in the open education resources. So for instance, you look in the top, uh, look, looking at the normal probability curve, uh, can you strip out or avoid putting in labels on the animation so that you could have both, you could have biology descriptors or you could have psychology descriptors or you could have mathematical descriptors, but the animation is to, of the normal curve of distribution remains the same. And the question then comes is who's going to pay for the development of such high quality resources? And I was, saw an interesting announcement from the Canadian federal government. They are putting money into the colleges and institutes Canada, uh, a large sum of money, 
for um, developing skills. And I'd like to see some of that money used for developing this kind of open educational resource that could be shared across all the colleges in Canada. So the problem at the moment is there's a lack of good quality, easy use multimedia open education resources. And nearly all of it at the moment is in English. There is some in French, from France and so on, but basically it's an English language phenomenon. We need open education resources in other languages in other countries as well. Um, most at the moment are cheap and text-based. We need to move them into multimedia and, and we need to build national programs for open educational resource development. If we do that, we give the students resources to learn, free resources to learn. This is the equivalent of giving students uh, pencils and paper when they first went to school. This is the 21st century equivalent of giving them the digital resources they need to learn. So we've got many tools, but very little training, not so much in the tools, but in the pedagogical approaches needed to make full, take full advantage of the tools. And it means a shift in our teaching methods to more learner-centered teaching. So whatever technology we use, we need to first determine the learning goals. We need to work out an appropriate teaching method that exploits these tools. We need to identify the affordances of the tools and make sure they do what they, they can do best. And we need to have a method of selection so we get the right tools and the right media um, for whatever teaching purpose we have. So I don't think there's one killer application. Um, there are some technologies, I think, that are more universal, like learning management systems and Zoom, but there's no one technology that's going to solve all our problems. We're probably going to have to combine media. The one killer application would be better training of instructors to use technology for teaching. So there's lots of choice today. Uh, and the costs of using technology have come down dramatically over the last 10 to 15 years. There's little research or theory, but we need that. We need more research about what works best and how to use media in their best ways. Uh, and we need some theory about uh, the affordances of different technologies. We need to learn linking, link learning outcomes, especially skills, uh, skills development to the affordances of different media to make sure we're using media to develop the skills we want in learners. And we have to understand that the learners themselves can now create media and they can do that to demonstrate their knowledge in richer ways than just paper and pencil tests. So technology is not the problem. We have lots of technology. The real problem is we need better instructor training in learning design in order to fully exploit the benefits of, tech, of technology. We have a, we're probably going to need a combination of different tools with different affordances depending on the context in which they're being used. And we need to ask that fundamental question of what can face-to-face -face, face -face teaching do better um, than what can be done through the use of tools that may be more convenient for students to use. What is the uniqueness of face-to-face -face teaching and why are we fully exploiting that when students come to class? So to wrap up, um, there are some general questions for discussion but I hope you'll come up with your own. Uh, if you want to contact me, that's my contact address and I have a website and the cold YouTube channel uh, for other uh, uh, videos in this series. Thank you very much for this, and once again, thanks to the Commonwealth for Learning for their help with these videos.